it's kind of a neat parlor trick, you know? You can amaze your friends by making cream puffs. This is the Heritage Cookbook Project podcast, where we connect with cooks across the country to talk about food memories and family recipes and learn just a little bit more about one another. And I'm your host, Leigh Olson. My name is Nancy Spiller. I live in Pacific Palisades, California, and I am a writer and a visual artist. In my chat with food writer, visual artist, and author Nancy Spiller, we talk about making The Invisible Visible, a fictional food writer who makes a living writing about pretend dinner parties, and how recipes have the ability to transport you to exotic locations. Primarily I paint, but I'm also something of a conceptual artist. For example, uh, a few years back I did Reverse Trash Dreams, the junk mail project, was one year's worth of junk mail that was shredded and turned into a gallery installation and a series of paintings called Shred It. I also illustrated with gouache paintings and line drawings my memoir, Compromise Cake, Lessons Learned from My Mother's Recipe Box. How fun. How did you come up with that concept? I was living in Glendale in a home with five flights of stairs up to my home office, and it was a boom economy. We were getting buried under junk mail. I was told by the local police that you really needed to shred your junk mail because this was an identity theft concern. So I decided, no, I'm not taking it up five flights of stairs and shredding it and then carrying it back down. I'm just going to save it all in the garage for a year. And then I'm taking it somewhere and I am going to uh, shred it and bag it and weigh it. And I did that. And it was 157 pounds of uh, junk mail. I also consider myself to be a recovering journalist. And as a journalist, I felt I could write about it, but it would disappear into the ether. But as an artist, I could, uh, you know, let people see what, you know, a year's worth of junk mail looked like. I was making the invisible visible. So I found a gallery that went along with that and did the installation and did the series of paintings. The series of paintings were abstracts taken from the shredded mass, and they were done small images on large sheets of frosted vellum plastic, which was referencing medieval illuminated manuscripts. We displayed it like a 157-pound tsunami wave of shredded junk mail coming out of the back of the small gallery in Culver City. So where are the pieces of art now? Well, thank you for asking. Because of the um, positive review in Art in America, which I was told by other artists was something that people kill for, I was told by the, the gallery owner, you know, it's, it's a historic pile now, so you should preserve it. And so I have it in my living room. I had um, fabricated a plexiglass tower that is six feet tall by two feet by two feet to represent the presence of a human. And then that didn't take the 157 pounds. I had to go for a whole other tower, and I did it as blocks, as cubes, two foot by two foot cubes. You stack them up. There are three of them. You get a second tower that's six feet tall, but we have the three we have the three cubes arranged in a way that there are a television stand in the living room, and we decorated it Christmas, and it's our Christmas tree. That is so cool. I love that. <laughs> so it's Merry Christmas from the Junk Mail Project, right? Yeah, one hundred and fifty pounds, one hundred and fifty-seven pounds. Yeah, that's a human being. It is a human being. And, you know, not only are are we supposed to bring it into our house and shred it and process it and all that stuff, but I talked with the mail carriers and they were getting injuries from carrying all of this stuff and delivering it. And I was actually told when I was doing this project, I was told by a postal worker that was what was paying for the post office was to deliver this junk to your mailbox. That was supporting the postal service. Yeah, that makes sense, sadly. But it's a great TV, uh, you know, stand. I recommend it. (laughs) It's very classy Mm -hmm. TV stand. It is, yeah. (laughs) 
So you'd mentioned that you're a recovering journalist. So did you start in journalism? I did. I started in journalism. Uh, when I started in the 1970s, uh, journalism was the way to see the world. So I was started as a freelance writer. I wrote in San Francisco. I moved to New York for a couple of years. I freelance wrote. And then I came back to California, back to the Bay Area, and I got on staff at the San Jose Mercury News. Then I came down to Los Angeles, and I was on staff at the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. I felt I needed to do something more meaningful. So I went back towards My first um, passion about writing, which was writing fiction and writing more personal writing, Uh, worked on a novel for far too long, but I got it published, and that was Entertaining Disasters, a novel with recipes, and um, that was followed by Compromise Cake. And both of them had something to do with food and, and recipes. Both of them did. Entertaining Disasters was a novel with recipes. The story was of a contemporary Los Angeles food writer who is doing her first dinner party in a decade because she's just been making them up for the page for that long because she's actually socially paralyzed. An editor comes to town and that she's been working with long distance, and that editor now wants an invitation to one of her renowned dinner parties. So she has to do it, and that's when we find her, is the week in which she has to do this first dinner party in a decade. And her whole life starts to fall apart in that week. The house that she lives in starts to fall apart. Her husband takes off on a business trip. She can't pull all the ingredients together. And her estranged sister threatens to show up. And she starts reliving her challenging childhood of the 1960s. And um, a little autobiographical. I really had fun putting the recipes into that book. You know, like exotic things, because as a child, I would cook things that would help me travel far away from my home in the suburbs. I love that you talk about, as a child, that you made recipes that transported you somewhere else. What were some of those recipes that, as a child, transported you to somewhere outside of suburbia? Things like, you know, at the time, if you put a pineapple, slice of pineapple on anything, you were in Hawaii. I did Mexican uh, wedding cookies, different, you know, pastries that were from different parts of the world. So I would do that kind of travel out of the kitchen. I love that. And I think that that is one of the things that food does. It does transport us. And and you're right. You know, the 60s was kind of a homogenous time. We had moms that were entering the workforce and there was the industrialization of food and it did become very homogenous. So I can totally empathize with using the food as an escape, but even more than that, as as an adventure point. Yeah. It was, you know, a great way to be able to imagine through the different flavors and stuff what that part of the world would be like. And the idea, like with the tagine, that you were combining fruit with your meat was exotic. You know, because I think that suburban cooking was pretty, things were separated out. You know, you had your little pile of peas and your little pile of mashed potatoes and then your slice of, you know, meatloaf. And you know, never the twain should meet. It was um, just a good way to, to have more of an adventure. And also one of the reasons that I did as much cooking as I did as a kid was that my mother had, uh, she was very depressed. Uh, She had some mental health concerns. And so I did a lot of cooking because it was a very creative outlet for me. Prior to her kind of uh, giving up, I did spend time with her in the kitchen and she did teach me to do things like baking. She taught me a lot about it. And so we spent some good time together doing that. And then when she sort of gave up on the project, I got to, uh, explore it further. That's how I came to enjoy food and cooking. And, and I, and then as an adult, along with my college textbooks, I got a copy of the joy of cooking. And I still have that copy of The Joy of Cooking with me. And I cooked all through college and I, you know, continued cooking all through, you know, my adulthood. But then I also started writing about food. After the break, we talk about making something out of nothing, vintage cooking implements, and being fearless. 
This episode of the Heritage Cookbook Project podcast is supported by Bob's Red Mill. When you're making those treasured family recipes, don't leave the quality of your ingredients to chance. Visit bobsredmill.com to find out more about this employee-owned company, their products, and how you can fill your pantry with them. With their products, not their employees. And now back to Nancy and how making cream puffs has changed from the 1960s to today. When I was at the Santa Fe Mercury News, I, I was one of the feature writers for their magazine. And one of the stories I talked them into sending me to and letting me partake of was this wonderful dinner that was 10 celebrity chefs, Jeremiah Towers, Alice Waters, um, Wolfgang Puck came up from Southern California. Danny Kay was there as one of the celebrity guests. Just this tremendous evening. So that was kind of the food writing that I got to do. And then when I came down to Los Angeles, when I got back into writing personal essays, I was doing food-oriented personal essays for the Los Angeles Times Sunday Magazine and had a lot of fun writing about individual food topics. So I enjoy writing about food as much as I do, um, you know, cooking and, and exploring, adventuring. Do you think that your writing about food um, harkens back to taking care of your mother? I mean, I think it was taking care of myself. One of the great things about cooking is that, you know, you learn the magic of making something out of nothing. So you had mentioned that before your mother kind of gave up, that she taught you how to make these cream puffs. And you described that recipe as miraculous. Yeah, well, that is the fundamental making something out of nothing. Um, you just take you take some flour and butter and some eggs and you turn it into this miraculous thing that goes from a little you know silky little nugget of nothing in a on a baking sheet to puff up to have this you know moist interior that's basically hollow that you can fill with anything but whipped cream is really good or ice cream is really good and then you put chocolate sauce on top of it and. It just becomes, you know, it's a celebration. A cream puff is as good as it gets. You know, that's a celebratory, comforting thing. You know, it's a party. A cream puff is a party. Wherever you put the cream puff, there's the party. And uh, so, you know, that was a wonderful thing to learn how to make at my mother's side. I agree. I think that it is such a miracle for it to go from that blob of batter into something so ethereal and you can put any fillings in it can be sweet it can be savory and it has that that crispy crust and that nice silky soft interior it is just you know absolutely remarkable so we had to have the double boiler and that's what you uh you had the butter and the flour cooked in the double boiler, and then you put the eggs in. It was all done over a hot water bath. We would do whipped cream, and it was always real whipped cream. We never used ready whip. We got the heavy cream, and we didn't have an electric mixer to do it. My mother wouldn't upgrade the kitchen to that degree to have an electric mixer. We had one of those hand crank egg beaters, and that's what we had to do the whipped cream with. So that took like forever. Because we were using the double boiler for the cream puff dough, we melted the chocolate in an inverted lid of a Revere Wear pan and over the hot water bath. And your chocolate was always sticking under the ridge of the lid. So that was always, you know, imperfection was, you know, was guaranteed, you know, getting all of the chocolate out of that lid. But somehow we managed, and um, and the party continued on. Uh, Zoe, my my grandchild, she brought this recipe that you know sort of cut cut away some of the things that made it a little bit more of a challenge to do when I was a kid. With this recipe, the Epicurious one, the whipped cream is enhanced with the neat trick of doing uh, vanilla pudding, you fold it in. So it's this incredibly light, but it's got a little something more than just whipped cream going on. And, and these were cream puffs that you made with Zoe. Yeah. And when did you make these? We made them this December. 
in Lake Tahoe. And she came and her mom packed up all of the ingredients and sent the recipe along. And we uh, did it in this uh, rented uh, Airbnb townhome. And, uh, and Zoe was, she's 11 years old and she was remarkably confident as a baker. And they've been baking Zoe and her uh, fraternal twin sister, Lily. The girls have been baking for, for years now. They watch all of those baking competition shows. But so Zoe, you know, we wanted to uh, bake and Zoe brought all of the stuff for the cream puffs and brought it over to um, that kitchen. And again, it was her confidence in her baking that I just got a big kick out of. So, And how do you think they were introduced to baking? Do you think it was because we have so many celebrity chef shows and the competitions or does her mother bake? Well, their mother likes to bake. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. They they just do a lot, you know. They like they like to eat baked goods, and so they got into baking baked goods, and they do cakes and they do um, cookies. They're pretty successful with uh, pretty much everything that they take on. But they get out a lot more than I did when I was a kid. So their combination of baking it also includes competing on a national level in snowboarding, and um, so they burn off. They burn off the baked goods a lot better than I ever did when I was their age. Oh, that's neat. So do you have any idea why Zoe picked cream puffs or was that something that you guys talked about making? Um, I just think that she had been making them lately. I think she'd gotten into making them and that she really enjoyed doing it. And it is kind of a neat parlor trick, you know? You can amaze your friends by making cream puffs. So if there was one piece of advice that you would give to listeners who want to make this recipe, what would it be? Be fearless. Follow the directions, but be fearless. You know, don't be intimidated. If you enjoyed hearing Nancy's memories about cream puffs and want to hear more stories like this, please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could take five minutes away from the egg beater and leave a rating and review... It'll help me reach more people like you who love stories about food. The full recipe for cream puffs can be found at theheritagecookbookproject.com. And don't forget to register for access to printable cookbook pages. Thanks. Oh, and the protagonist of Nancy's novel, Entertaining Disasters, does host an actual dinner party. But it's less about the party and more about the journey, realization, and resolution.